other night. Seems a bit more special than just your ordinary evening. Halloween's always a, been a special time at the slaughterhouse. I'm not sure that any of you will be seeing Steve Cannon again anytime soon, but I don't think what he does is really all that difficult anyway. Let me introduce myself. I am Jingle Biggs, and I'll be speaking to... What you doing, Jingles? <laughs> Woo! What you doing in here all by yourself, sitting in the dark? Uh, it's, it's, not, it's not completely dark, Mr. Mister Biggs, is it? Oh, yeah, you know. How could you mistake your cousin uncle brother? Well, Trig, it, Trig Biggs. <laughs> it, is, it is a special evening. Halloween and also I thought maybe I'd be a bit more formal, Mr. Oh, oh. Biggs. Hey, I can't complain. I won't argue with that. It's good to see you here. Have you uh, seen our friend Jason? He was supposed to be here to handle some filming. Well, yeah, he did. He stumbled in a while back. I, I told him I'd handle his equipment. And uh, last time I saw him, he was stumbling down on the, on the kill floor. Uh, not sure where he got to. <laughs> it looks, uh, these look like a bit of his pant matter in here. Oh, pardon, the, pardon the nose, it gets a bit genuine when I'm excited. I can smell it. That's uh, those four day pants he was wearing. I yeah, <laughs> they were they were four day pants two days ago. <laughs> oh, boy. But we we saw them. We cheered him. Give it, cheered him in that problem. <laughs> oh, <laughs> salt rub. Yes, yeah, sir. Yeah, For any of you that don't know, this here place is called the Slaughterhouse. Uh, and this is. Would we go so far as to call you the proprietor, Mr. Biggs? Well, well, now, I don't like to mess with the numbers, but I am the foreman here, and I do make sure that the rest of the family is doing what they got to do to get things done. Well, you know, for, for those of you that haven't been down here to visit uh, all us Biggs, I said Biggs, not pigs, Biggs, <laughs> uh, was that a laugh or funny. was that a laugh? Well, I mean, just funny that it rhymes, not like it was planned or anything. <laughs> <laughs> now that was definitely uh, annoying. Now we we got a whole family business going on down here at the at the slaughterhouse, and and uh, it looked to you. Oh no, I mean this this was not cheap. I'm telling you. The, the doc fixed me up right proper, but it took many, many surgical uh, procedures to get to this beautiful state. Tell us a bit about the rest of the, the family, and because, uh, uh, you know, I spend a lot of my time just jingling about I really don't know how it all kind of come to pass, but I think everybody that's watching, uh, I wouldn't necessarily suggest that you come down here unless you'd like to meet a similar fate to our friend Jason, but uh, Mr. Biggs, tell him a little bit about how in the hell this wonderful place, the slaughterhouse, come to be. Well, hell is about right. See, uh, it's a long story, and I'm going to let you know first off, uh, I'm, you might get tripped up a bit because there's a lot of different turns and tributaries to this big river of blood. But, uh, but a long time, well, let me tell you first, if you go on to the website, you can look, you can look over the timeline of the family. We got one of them? Oh, hell yeah. What, oh, what is it? Oh, it's www.herepig, and H-E-R-E, not like you heard the pig, but like you hear pig, come on, herepig.com. Go on on there, you can look at the history page, it'll tell you the timeline. Now, that's not going to get any thick of it, I'll tell you a little bit more about that now. But uh, we also going to release a little story, you know, release a paperback at some point in time you can look at. But but uh, back in the mid-1850s, as you know, Jingles, uh, 
or a progenitor of the family. Uh, the pro what? Progenitor. That's what they told me it was called. I don't know for sure. I didn't get too far through the parochial. But uh, he, uh, Z.L. Biggs, Zebedee Leviathan, uh, great, 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 great granddaddy, uh, he came over here from uh, Middle Europe somewhere and uh, he was going to start a new hog farm because he came from old hog farm practice over there. And uh, so he came over and he bought a little piece of land down in Chattanooga, what is now Chattanooga, Tennessee. And uh, he started up, you know, and and then right about then the Civil War started was going on and whatnot. And uh, so he, he joined that. Uh, well, it was against his will, but he, he, he was part of that. Joined in under a surgeon and uh, uh, he, he started uh, cutting other kinds of pigs. And, uh, what do you mean? What do you mean by that? I mean, he started. He was working on on uh, fallen soldiers. Whoa! Yeah, um, he had a lot of knowledge from working with pigs, so they he, he quickly became a surgeon's apprentice. And uh, I mean, it, it gets thick, but uh, he basically went on to develop a lot of surgical implements uh, that uh, that could be used in medical practice. And. Uh, <laughs> Yeah, who's that? God damn it. There's a lot of pigs running around you here. Know, it's you know. probably Willie down in the shower room. Huh. I'm telling you, I told him he needs to get he needs to do that in the morning. It's about third shift. Jason ain't all that bad tasting. It's kinda like popcorn if you will. Oh, oh uh, yeah, I got my fill. Oh <laughs> well thanks. Oh. So yeah, I mean it just keeps going from there. Uh, but uh, but he ran into H.H. H. Holmes up in Chicago trying to sell them tools. And that's when shit really hit the fan. What what kind of tools? Well, he had a couple of different uh, uh, speculums and some dividers and some bone, bone saws that he developed that just right, get right to the meat of the matter, uh, you know, quicker than what they had already developed before. Now, I've heard stories sitting around the, you know, the premises and such, that at some point in all of that, uh, great, great, granddaddy, or just great, great? Oh, guy that started to get a liking to the human side of things versus the pig, now is that right? No, he actually, he, it, it, uh, it, it didn't, you know, he was a good man. And I, I don't wanna, I don't wanna uh, put that on him. Now, it really was his first son and daughter who was born of the mistress of Holmes when uh, they ran from Chicago. And I, don't, I mean, there's a whole story there, but they took off, went back to the family farm. That's that whole, that's gonna come out in that whole Slaughterhouse book you was talking about, oh, right? Yeah, we're gonna release the novel, uh, the, the whole, all, all the bloody details. That's probably what's gonna be called, the bloody details, something like that, I don't know. But uh, yeah, you'll, you'll hear, you'll read about it all right there. But those twins, that was really the turning point for our family. And uh, that's when things really started to go right. <laughs> oh, that's, I, I'm full, so I'm gonna put <laughs> I don't know. Really... Them pants, the six day pants, they ain't quite the seasoning <laughs> we were hoping for. <laughs> I think I got a bit of the, the crotch zipper there. <laughs> <laughs> so, Tell, uh, tell them, if you would, uh, how we found this fine place and uh, how operations kind of got running and uh, things of that nature. Certainly. So uh, about 2010 is when we settled on Iowa. We had to shut the rest of our enterprises down across the country because the, uh, insp the, the federal inspectors came in. And they found some things to be suspect. So we shut down. Suspect? Well, I mean, that's just the words they used, you know. <laughs> they uh, seem pretty right as the mail to me, but go ahead. That's how I feel about it, too. But, you know, I mean, there's different people have different perspectives. And there's a lot of snowflakes falling uh, this time of year, if you know what I mean. Uh, so, uh, you know, uh, they, they came in and shut a bunch of it down. We moved into Iowa about 2010. We couldn't find a permanent spot some place that worked well so we bounced around a couple few different places 
And then uh, basically we went dark in 2013, couldn't find the right spot. And then this last year, we found this this spot down here, just near downtown Des Moines, uh, by the old Colonial Bread Factory. This has actually, uh, a, among other things, including slaughtering, also used to be the Iowa Paint Factory warehouse or, or a factory. And uh, so yeah, we set up here about a year ago. We put all the walls back up. And we uh, put the kill floor back together, and yeah, we uh, we we're back in business. How were them early years? Because I was got some pretty healthy. Uh, what would we say? Some pretty healthy folk. Pretty healthy stock. Oh, the stock was a good word. That's that's not going to offend. That, yeah. Right, right. That should be politically <laughs> correct enough for them. Yep, yeah, you know, it's, it's hard these days. You gotta watch what you say. You gotta watch what you eat. You gotta watch what you say while you're eating. I mean, it, it's just a mess. And now, how things been now that you, I mean, you got yourself, we got, we got ourselves, <laughs> we got our, uh, some pretty fine digs here. What all, what all goes on when people come down for a tour. Now I've heard that a few of those, that there's been some cases of missing persons and some things like that. I mean, this is just all, this is all on the up and up pork product, correct? Oh yeah, definitely. I mean, aside from, you know, that Jason thing was just a joke, of course. Yeah, he's around here, so he that did. was probably him going through a door. Yeah, right yeah, there. yeah. Uh, but no, uh, we uh, we actually specialize in our number one product, number one selling product internationally, which is uh, Big's brand, copyrighted, okay. Trademark, Big's brand. Trade, trademark. B-I-G-G-S, correct? That's right, there's yep. an extra G. Wee oui, wee, oui, wee oui, wee, oui. uh, that's what we say. And uh, I tell you, it's called mystery meat, and that's trademarked. You ain't gonna find that anywhere else. You you buy somebody else on this off-brand mystery meat, question mark meat. That's the wrong stuff. That ain't the same. Mystery meat is what we provide, and I can't tell you all the ingredients. There's a lot of secret ingredients in there. Well, that's why you that's why you trademark it. Things of that nature. That's right. People yeah. are always trying to get a free ride. That's right. That's right. <sighs> now that product is really. You know, again, I just jingle around, have a little fun here and there, so I uh, don't know much about the business. Yeah, yeah. But it seems like <laughs> things have been rolling ever since we really we released Big's Mystery Meat. Oh yeah, we got big contract after the uh, whole uh, U.S. Army contract went kibosh. Got kibosh went south. Uh, we set up a new contract with the the public school system. All around the nation, and that's when mystery meat really started to hit. And uh, yeah, uh, so <laughs> I mean, when you come down here, you know, we're what we offer in October is for the general public to come on down, John Q, bring your family, your little piglets, and whatnot. And uh, you come on in, we give you a tour, we give you a tour unlike you've never seen before, and uh. We and they can meet the whole family. Oh, you get to meet everybody from Maybell to Lefty uh, to Mouth Breather to uh, Uncle Lester. Sorry, not Mouth Breather. <laughs> he, he gets pissed when we call him. Uh, Uncle Lester. I mean, they're all in there. Uh, so, yeah, Grandpa. Grandpa's in there rolling around somewhere right now. Probably can't find his way out again. And people might, I wouldn't want people to think that we're anything but accommodating and friendly down here. I mean, oh, when people come in and they bring the family through, they're going to get to see all the different rooms, aren't they? Oh, I mean, there's some pretty neat rooms in here, oh, Mr. Bates. Yeah, I mean, it's all legit. It's a real deal. It's a true McCoy. we got 13 rooms that currently are all open for the tour. Now, we're going to, we're going to open more rooms as we, as, as we get into the future years. But right now, the 13 main rooms that are on the tour include the receiving office and the dock, the loading bay, the locker room, the, the foreman's office. That's where you're going to see me. You're going to see the inspector's office. He's going to cut you from grid. I mean, uh, he's going to show you uh, all his special tools, tools of the trade. You can go walk through the furnace. It's going to turn you sideways. Uh, you go down the cart hall. You're going to go through the kill floor. The saw room. You of course, none of that's operational during the tour. It's all just for them to see. Oh, no, 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 no. We show you everything. We show you how it works. We're going to show you everything about how it works. <laughs> oh, that sounds a bit frightening. I'm not going to lie to most of them people out there. I mean, they should know that 
they're going to be able to come and go and maybe just a little scare, but it's perfectly safe. No one's actually been lost that they can prove, correct? Right. No, I mean, hey, this is entertainment, folks. <laughs> Yeah. Pure and simple. We're just here for a good time. Yeah. 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 The mystery meat and where that all comes from, that's proprietary information. It's a mystery. It's, it's, it's not like anybody's ever been harmed in the making of mystery meat. No, I, I mean, I don't even know what that's supposed to mean. And 13 rooms, some people might think that number 13 is a bit unlucky. I'm here to tell you, I've never had nothing but good luck from the day we stepped into these rooms. That's, yeah, no, it's, uh, it's been nothing. And it's but, treating you it's well. Rain, I mean, you've never looked better. Raining pennies from heaven. Uh, I'm saying, yeah, we, you know, it just happens to be coincidental that uh, the number is 13. It just happens to be coincidental that this reopening year contained uh, Friday the 13th as well. It just happens to be coincidental. Look at the draw. <laughs> Amen. And, and, and for anybody that was wondering about your wonderful transformation i mean what you have done in combining the best of uh the 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 swine and your already beautiful face if you don't mind me saying so oh, Mr. Okay. Bates, is i think people would be interested to know how that mix has come because you never know there might be somebody out there that'd like that look oh yeah so what do you want me to tell them about, about but, uh, you know i mean some people might think that ain't just normal. I mean, you worked hard to get that transformation. Oh, yeah. I mean, but uh, I didn't do it myself, like I said. The inspector, he took care of me. He, he stitched it all together. You know? it, it looks fantastic. Thank you. I appreciate it. Yeah, no, we, we work with some of the finest uh, proprietors uh, in the industry, the haunted attraction industry, uh, to, uh, to, to, to get this kind of effect, to get this kind of face, put this kind of face on it, you know? That's smooth. Oh. I ain't gonna lie, that's smooth. That's the kind of thing. Now, you got yourself a, is there a Mrs. Big, Mr. Big? <laughs> oh, well, <laughs> is there a? <laughs> well, is, is there a main Bigs in your life? Squeeze. <laughs> yeah, there you go. Uh, well, there we go. Wait, wait, I, I got I gotta interrupt you just a second. Yep. Now, the book's going to be coming out, so y'all are going to probably be interested in that. But, but, uh, but if you have any questions regarding the slaughterhouse or the Biggs family, uh, or if you're wondering what happened to Jason and Steve, any of the questions, type them in there because uh, we've got one of our Biggs family. Now, it's, it, it, he's a bit shy, but he's on the computer, and he'll be happy to answer them questions. Now, back to, back to Mrs. Biggs. Yes. Is there a Mrs. Biggs? Well, uh, there have been several. Or are you not necessarily a, <laughs> a, a one suey man? <laughs> I think we're all kind of getting a drift. You know what I mean? I am, I am the epitome of uh, male chauvinist, is what they tell me. And I don't know quite what epitome means, but uh, I do love the pit. It's got a good flavor. <laughs> <laughs> I like everything about this. Uh, we're going to be here a while now. I mean, what? what's the... It seems to me like this is just going to go on forever. I know we're talking about expansion and with mystery meat going through the roof, we ought to be able to do all kinds of things. Now, uh, you know, it's a little bit slow in here. Now, granted, that's because it's Halloween and that's kind of our special night with the Biggs family. But where are we going... In the, in the future, are people going to have to wait a whole another year to come back and see this wonderful place we built, or is there going to be an opportunity to visit uh, at different times throughout the year? So uh, it all depends on uh, on uh, how how the season turns out. We're going we're we're going through the till right now, uh, but we are going to provide different experiences throughout the year for those who really can't get enough uh, during just the, the October season. So you can. You can bet your swine we're gonna we're gonna provide some opportunities to uh, to see uh, parts and different uh, in different ways of of our beautiful factory. We're very proud of it. We do want to share it, uh, but there, there will be some opportunities throughout the year. 
Uh, but if you stay tuned and you keep uh, you you keep a watch on the site, you get a, you subscribe on our website. You're gonna you're gonna get all that information when it comes up and ready. Let's tell all them soon to be and past slaughterhouse fans where they can go so they can stay in the know. Okay, well you gotta go directly to hearpig.com. And I mean like, here pig, here pig, not like the listening kind, okay? So, here pig You can do some listening with them ears. Oh, well, oh, actually, it kind of impedes. But, I, 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 you know, I got some rubber bands. I just kind of look them out the way. So, here pig.com, and they can sign up so they can be on the end, because we're talking. I mean, we might even have us some private parties where they could have some mystery. I mean, people could do all, all sort of things, right? Very possible. <laughs> There you go. There ain't no shortage of fun. You know, you can't have slaughter without laughter. You know that, right, Steve? I'd say that's a, as good a job as we could do to finish off this section of our <laughs> of our evening. Keep that in your hearts and minds as you go on the rest of the evening in your life that you can't have slaughter without laughter. <laughs> 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 All right, y'all. We're gonna switch gears. Stay with us because uh, we got the real man behind this whole damn story. That was that was not a leg bone or anything that just fell on the floor. That was that was uh, ham bone. Ham ha ham bone. But um, uh, <laughs> this is Ian Miller. Jason is okay. Uh, these these are these are not his entrails and six day old pants. Although he is working some six day old pants, we didn't we didn't make that part up. Uh, but we wanted to drop the the mask and such because with every one of our guests that we've had, uh, there's always a lot more behind the scenes, and uh, this is no different. Ian uh, has authored a book called The Niche, and. Uh, it's a whole, it's a whole different ball game, and so we figured to talk about that uh, and and that journey, and also what's going on uh, with uh, edutainment or mentortainment. We'll talk about that. Uh, we dropped the mask because we're we're leaving the slaughterhouse behind, and we're going to talk a little bit about uh, the niche and the authorship and all of that. But uh, let's just start with how this, how the niche, how that all happens. Are you a, are you a five-year-old kid that spends his time watching scary movies or, you know, just always having these far-fetched, creative kind of ideas? Has, has the world of creating always been in your blood? Yeah, well, I, I was the son of a sign painter, so I grew up surrounded by artistry and I, I struggled with the term artist and art because for us it really was just a way of making a living dad just painted to provide hot dogs so um, so yeah it's not uh, that he did hot dog signs but to buy hot he dogs actually he did hot dog signs <laughs> from, from time to time to, all right, right on. Uh, but no I uh, so I was always surrounded by it. my mom was uh, kind of a hippie um, and so she was she was always tie-dyeing dresses in the basement while you know dad was uh, at the car shop pinstriping all night long so uh, it was just it was kind of what I grew up around and surrounded by um, by the time I was seven or eight years old I was helping create pounce patterns for gym murals and I was out working with dad it was just what what life was um, and so, you know, being a child of the 80s, uh, I was born in 81, and so I'm, I'm part of what I consider the 8-bit generation. It's that little gap generation between the, the Xers and the, and the Y generation, right? And so we have this really uncanny perspective uh, where we grew up without uh, any technology. We were Boy Scouts. We were out camping every weekend, you know, we were learning to tie knots and, and, uh, and you know, talking to girls through cootie catchers. You know, not through text messages, and uh, and then it, we, but we got to that age where we also started, uh, you know, we started finding technology. Te technology was coming in at that time, so well, there's kind of a 
kind of a kind of a bridge generation. That's how I see it. Um, and in the '80s, we had some of the greatest uh, the greatest practical effects in cinema. So I was a huge fan of not only like Jim Henson's work with the Labyrinth and the Dark Crystal and and the Creature Shop work. Um, but also all the other fantasy films like The Neverending Story and, um, and Legend and the list goes on and on uh, from that time period. But they used practical effects. There was no CGI, there was no technology. You know, there was technology, but it was very, very young technology. Um, and so I was fascinated by that. I really wanted to do that kind of work. I wanted to create creatures and, and, and realms and worlds and, and live in that kind of in, in that kind of headspace and that kind of world but you're a kid in Des Moines you're landlocked there's no access to Hollywood except through the back of maybe a Fangoria magazine and so the most accessible form of creative the kind of creative work I wanted to do was horror it was it was horror magazines that was that was uh, the most accessible because you could all you could mail order and also go to like the theatrical shop and buy uh, nose and scar wax and, and scab blood and all of the things you need liquid latex to create appliances and create effects that you would see um, cinematically. So that's where my, my passion kind of started to take a turn towards the horrific. It wasn't because I was drawn towards horror, um, even though like anyone else, there is a portion of the sadomasochistic, you know, mentality in all of us, you know, we all have a little bit of that, um, but that wasn't my drive. That wasn't really the inspiring force. It was accessible. It was accessible. Yeah. Led you, led you down that. And now how old, how old are you when that sort of making the face, making the scar on the side of the head, sneaking around the corner, boo, when, when that sort of stuff starts to happen? At what age? Yeah. Yeah. I was like eight or nine. Yeah. And so, yeah. And you're hooked. Like, oh. it's, it's your thing. Well, the, the thing that actually hooked me is I started getting into it. I had a makeup kit that I always say rivaled most middle-aged women's makeup kits by the time I was nine years old. Yeah. But the thing that really hooked me was I had a kid, a, a neighbor friend up the street, who his parents were the exact, exact opposite of mine. Even though mine were super liberal, left-wing, they were also very Christian. So I was like... I remember being in a garage sale and looking through a tape rack when I was, I don't know, seven, eight years old. And I grabbed this tape and my mom snatched it out of my hands. It was Ozzy Osbourne, you know, and she's like, that's the devil. And I'm like Detroit <laughs> Rock City style, you know, like, ah, it's the devil. Everything's the devil. Don't, can't watch Smurfs. You can't go trick or treating. Everything's the devil. Uh, she's lightened up since then. She kind of, <laughs> she kind of has to, right? Um, but uh, that's the price she pays. <laughs> um, but uh, no, I love my mom. Love your mom. I know you'll never see this, but um, <laughs> still get to give props yeah, yeah. to mom always. Uh, yeah, yeah, right, exactly. I'm uh, right there. But uh, no, we had these. Uh, I had a friend up the street. Uh, Tom Sorderberg was his name, and uh, his mom was exactly the opposite. Like his parents had split, and they were very into the occult and weird stuff, and they very much got to trick or treat and didn't have to go to church on Sunday. You know, got to watch Ren and Stimpy um, <laughs> and all these things. And they, uh, I would go up there and I'd be fascinated by their very different perspective of the world. And <clears throat> so that's where um, I started really uh, getting in touch with the, the horror aspect. Um, they in, they uh, introduced me to Bloody Mary, um, you know, on the wall, in the, in the bathroom. I don't know if you ever did that. No. Okay. Uh, yeah, this whole thing, this, this, this legend of Bloody Mary where um, if you go in the bathroom and you turn, you look in the mirror and turn around three times and say Bloody Mary three times in the mirror, then this, this, uh, the spirit of this, like, crone witch, you know, that's trapped in the mirror would come out and get you. I hate so, being scared. Just this story. Yeah. Just this story sucks. So, you know, like, light as a feather, stiff as a board, those kinds of things. Like, they were all in, they were into all that stuff. Yeah, gotcha. older sister. And I remember they trapped me in the basement one time. And they turned the, they turned the, uh, the radio on and they blared it and they trapped me in this underneath the stairs and before they did so they told me that poltergeists absolutely love loud music like that's that's like the lure for poltergeists and so they trapped me in there and they freaked me out it was terrible i mean they were abusing me basically you know but <laughs> but uh, it was very exciting and uh, then I, I remember just a year after that, I think. The good news is that. everything's everything's completely normal, folks. Yeah. No, man. no residual effects <laughs> whatsoever. <laughs> 
<laughs> so yeah, um, they they decided they wanted my help to uh, to turn their shed into a haunted a little haunted house thing. So one year they put up some sheets in the shed, and then his sister played the banshee in the corner, and Tom got to be the guy that dropped out of the ceiling panel, and I got to be the guy that took the nickel, you know, at the at the door. And um, I think we had like three people come through, but I like you know I two nickels to rub together with an extra one there. But, <laughs> yeah. Uh, but no, they came in, they, they paid, they went through the little thing, they scared him at the end and then they went away. And that's where I was really like, wow, like you can create something that's totally encapsulates an idea and is totally immersive and people will pay to have that experience. It was like, so I, yeah, at like eight or nine, I'm like, wow, that's this great. Is, maybe I can, maybe I could do this at some point. It's just such a, it's just such a great thing. It's such a turn on. And I hope the people that are like watching this on a semi-regular basis, if we're lucky enough that people tune in more than once to this thing is just that, that thoughts become things and, and people start at whatever age and it grows into these things and to, and to, to foster that in, in our youth and people to follow their dreams and their lemonade stand may become Steve Jobs or it, you know it, it, it's that start and and I love you know because you're just doing it because you love it you yeah know, at that yeah. point you're like totally you know someone shows you this as your future 25 years later you'd be like I don't even know what that is I'm not even sure I like that you know but that's where it starts right is following that path and 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 you go there so yeah let's Jumping from the, the three nickels to rub together in this kind of epiphany that I can create and and uh, have a little scratch, right? Sustain it. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So did that lead to theater and that sort of thing into the high school and that? Or did you kind of, you know, I had a, I, I remember, it's funny, I would have never thought about this had we not met, but I had a babysitter that uh, the dude was into eight millimeter. Oh, yeah. And this would have been probably, I would have been like 12, I'm a, a little bit older than you, so it would have been like 70s and he played like Bella Lugosi all the all the older like mummy films and that kind of stuff and it just it just uh it just reminded me of that and I wondered if if your horror path kind of led to any like study of the genre that sort of thing or was it more kind of here's a nice little Johnny A student and then you know back uh, at home you've got this nice little dark area where you play and do your you know how did how did that work out uh, actually a very um, atypical adolescence um, I I actually was pulled out of school in eighth grade for uh, being a disturbance to the class uh, multiple times to the point where uh, <clears throat> they actually took me out of school and they attempted to homeschool me um, but I I was uh, and that disturbance if you don't mind talking about it if you no, do that school but that disturbance being like you know, every time somebody run, comes around the corner, you're like, ah! no, you know, or just more rebellious kind of stuff. Rebellious and actually more of a class clown than anything else. Yeah, I would, I would be able, you know, I had this innate ability to command the the audience in the class, and so I would always like Mr. Biggs, like Mr. Biggs. I just didn't have that quality of face at the time. <laughs> um, but uh, I would have if I had I been able to afford it. Four, a few uh, more nickels. Yeah, a few more nickels, please. Um, so, no, I, I, uh, I would overtake the classrooms and the teachers didn't know what to do with me. They didn't want to punish me because I wasn't being negative. I was, you know, typically getting the class to laugh and it was just detracting everybody from learning, right? Um, so they pulled me out to try and homeschool me and then I actually took a really hard right and, um, and found myself in rehab. So I didn't actually... Uh, complete high school. I actually went into rehab after a, a couple of years of really hardcore substance abuse. So I uh, went down that road and it just kept getting thicker and thicker and I spent what would have been high school in and out of inpatient and outpatient rehab. Um, luckily my parents were there 100% supported me through got me through that um, but it was a very trying period of my life. That was the long dark night of the soul for me, yeah. which I, I was, I'm glad I got it done earlier because I, I you know, I, I've got friends and I have a lot of people that are still struggling, struggling with those things today. Yeah. Um, but we but share, yeah. we share some, we share some road on that. Yeah. On that path, right? <laughs> so I, I see now even a little bit more while you were doing the mom thing like this. Yeah. My mom, you know, 
no no exaggeration saved my life sticking by my side through that long dark night so yeah. anyway not to detract yeah. but no hey amen brother glad it's you're still glad you're still yeah, here yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah right right on yeah. so yeah then then i i just after coming through that um i started rekindling those early childhood passions that um that i really uh always wanted to be my life and the world that that I created and that I was a part of. Um, and I, I don't know, I think I, I mostly found, I, I mostly reconnected with those passions through meditative practices and things that I picked up along the way, you know, throughout life. Um, but yeah, the, I mean, if it wasn't for all the amazing works that I found, even when I was really young, that were created stepping stones to higher meditative spiritual, spiritual practices and whatnot, I would have never, re, you know, found or reconnected with those early passions. But it was like find, reconnecting with the early passion it, and identifying it is what led me through to the successes that I'm now seeing at, you know, 33, 34, 35, 36 years old. Man, I'm, so. I'm, I'm flipping out. Our paths are so, <laughs> there's just so many similarities, which is, which is, again, one of the great things about these. You, you learn just a little bit about somebody enough to start a conversation and then you start, you start this and you find out everybody has so many different layers and, and the slaughterhouse. And again, I, I can already feel that this thing is taking a nice amount of time because it's vibing so well. So I want to uh, fast forward a little bit. The slaughterhouse stuff we shared with everybody, but uh, you've, you've also authored a book that is not just a book. I mean, I know just enough from Jason sharing it with me. There's a whole interactive, really super cool, this thing called the niche. Yeah. So let's let's kind of follow the same model we just went through and give people just first of all where they can find the niche, a little background on the niche. We were trying to figure out a way to play this video for you guys of the the, the book itself and the binding and the art that goes into this thing. I've uh, I've just authored my second book that hasn't come out yet, but looking at the detail and the stuff you did, dude, I was like I was blown away. It's so freaking cool and then it just jumps another layer and there's this whole mystery within the mystery and getting tools and finding out this and so yeah back to the start the niche how did that happen is it your first book it's a great segue because that whole like the stepping stone back to early passion um is really encapsulated in that you say where where do you find the niche well i mean that's the whole gist of the story is actually like the niche is is buried inside of yourself and inside of your path and your own journey and so the niche really embodies the whole concept because it really isn't a book it was a journey that i actually had to go through personally and therefore and it popped out as a leather bound book you know um and, and, and veiled in a lot of ways because you'll, you'll notice when you find the physical manifestation of the niche, the thing called the niche that I have been a very instrumental part of, um, the, uh, the author title is Satirist Jeering. And Satirist Jeering um, would be my cohort in the creation of that, that realm. Um, and Jeering, my, my relationship to Jeering and who Jeering is and what Jeering is more importantly is a whole nother story. And that is a very deep rabbit hole. Um, Alice hasn't fallen to the bottom of that hole yet. Like she's still tumbling in mid space. So yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Jeering's like, shut up. That's enough. <laughs> uh, uh, and would you get, is Jeering an alter ego or is Jeering a whole nother dude? No, Jeering's a, uh, Jeering's a being in and of himself. And, uh, and I heard he shows himself very seldom, if ever. Yeah, yeah. There's three things about Jeering. He always, he always arrives in a mask and typically not, some, not, not something like this, but he typically arrives in a mask. He never wears the same mask twice and he'll never admit that it's him. So it's pretty hard to pin him down. Yeah. Um, but fascinating, fascinating being. Um, so the the niche, uh, the way that we worked on that and created it was very much through that process of of identifying um, the the manifestation uh, of a creative work. <clears throat> so or of identifying creative process. So in the story, there are five characters. Um, first of all, it's an illustrated uh, prose. So it reads somewhat like Seuss, somewhat like Lewis Carroll. 
um, and then it's uh, it's uh, also got an illustration on every page. So there's five characters that you meet on this journey, this is kind of adventure tale of the, of the niche, and it's the itch, the twitch, the snitch, the glitch, and then finally the niche. And those five characters, so when creating this thing, trying to bring this story out of Jeering's mind and, and travels into a, a tangible form that makes sense to uh, any, you know, John Q. Um, we found that there are a lot of similarities and parallels in, in creative processes as they are identified by scholars and academics and, and um, thinkers and spiritualists and whatnot. And so those five characters actually are imbued with the spirit of the five steps of the creative process of manifestation and in several different ways. So there's different refractions of that kind of process, but each one of them kind of is in a different sector. But to kind of break it down simplistically, um, the itch is the idea stage. It's the it's it's uh, all of those concepts that are constantly bubbling to the surface when you when you're tapping into that creative self that's yeah. inside every person. You yeah. know, yeah. Um, that so, little voice that all of us have that or, says maybe I should do this. Yeah, or all of them. You know, like yeah. oh, like I don't know how you. I'm sure you're probably along the same lines, but I've got a million ideas constantly. Yeah. A million itches. A million itches. Yeah. So then the, the itch uh, from the itch. Uh, once we have identified one of those or, or captured one of those, then we move towards the twitch, and the twitch is the stage where we're acting on one idea. We're moving towards the realization of a concept or an idea, and that that is still a part of that. You know, it's where the the um, the flight of fancy begins, really, and the work really starts. And then once the work begins, and we stumble upon the snitch. The snitch being that first stage, um, or the the aha moment, the aha moment where we realize that we have something that is inherently uh, unique to our own perspective, and that we oftentimes get this uh, guarding kind of characteristic in that stage where we want to protect it. We don't we don't want it to be stolen. We don't want you know we don't want it to get out of our control. Like the mystery our perceived me. control. Like the mystery <laughs> me. Start trademarking, start talking to high intellectual property lawyers and spending all the money we didn't have that was supposed to be spent in other places on this fictitious kind of sense of control. So only to be told, well kid, you probably didn't need me. You know, in most cases. We've learned that lesson. So um, after the snitch, then we come through to the uh, the glitch stage, and the glitch stage is the evaluation stage, if you think about it in writing terms. But it's the uh, it's a stage where we are um, embodying the decision: is this really something that we can stand behind? Is this something that truly embodies what we are, and is it something that we want to deal with? This is something we want to put out into the real world and then have to deal with the reper repercussions of. So that's that final stage. <clears throat> and then the niche being the final, you know, the final stage, the, the realization, the manifestation of that concept, of that initial itch that's now evolved into this thing that now we are responsible for in a sense. You know, this is now this thing that we have summoned, you know. So yeah. and we've brought to life. Yep, and then it yeah. just starts all over again. Yeah, and, yeah. and created. And so uh, the niche, as I'm listening to it, the illustrations, the different things, I'm thinking immediately. I'm thinking, oh, this is uh, this is a kids' book. And then at the same time, as we're going through, I'm thinking, wow, this is this is great fodder for anybody. I mean, this is not just a what I originally thought was this Harry Potter kind of journey, right? Just it's just it's a story, right? But in listening to you walk it through, this is, I mean, this is juicy stuff. This is the whole honoring why you're here, honoring an idea, your own path. You know, when you're talking about the, the itch, you know, I'm, I'm hearing you and I'm hearing your story about your first little haunted house with the two or three people and that kind of man, that realization that this can be a creation and, and these steps and how they go. And and how you get here. This is your slaughterhouse and this is your niche and you brought it to life and it's your thing and you've released it, it's your deal, right? And so your target market, the people that are gonna really dig this or really, it's gonna really play to, is it that broad? Is it is it the five-year-old that's like going through there and it's just stimulating the mind and all of that, all the way to somebody who's sitting in a cubicle of principle and just has got this 
maybe just one itch because over the past 20 years, some of these other itches have just kind of shut themselves down, but there's still that one where they're like, I got to scratch that. What, yeah. Talk about your audience. There's no, like, I don't like to work within demographics. Yeah. I've always been like, let's shatter the demographic. Um, because I think that when you, when you, uh, put something in a quadrant, when you put something in a box, then it limits the, the cap the capacity of it, of that thing. So I, I don't typically work within demographics and boxes. And so <clears throat> the idea is that it touches on truths. It hits on truths. And so the root of the story, the root of the illustrations, the root of the whole of the, the entire manifestation of, of the niche project um, is just about simple truths and recognizing those things and, and using those simple truths that we all constantly are, you know, are telling each other. It's the cliches, it's the adages, it's, you know, it's all those, you know, uh, the grass is greener. It's, it's all of that. Like there, there are simple truths in that that are, that's old as the hills, you know, like that, that, that's all you really need. Uh, like are those simple truths. Everything else is just us just compounding and, and um, complicating this, the simplicity and beauty of life. And so it's really, I, I tried my best to distill that, that tale um, into a fluid truth that can, can kind of break through all of the clutter of a day um, and get straight to the reader. And it's veiled, it's got, it's a prose. It's, it's you know, flowery in, in some ways and, and fun to read. Um, and so here we are, the beginning, the start. Now please lend me your ear and prepare to depart on a journey, a voyage through thick and through thin to a land where the frowns have all turned into grins. Over wax under wane, we will float to a dream where the laughter is so thick that it turns into streams. So it is, it moves, but they're, they're in there. The gems are in there. Yeah. And, uh, but yeah. those gems aren't owned. They, they're, they're at best borrowed. You know, these are things that, that, um, I loved about the alchemist and yes. the power of now. And yes, like, man, right on. All those texts. Yeah, when you were going, I'm thinking, I was thinking the alchemist, and I'm like, you know, it's a wonderful story, but man, so many layers if you're willing and open and you can hear it. I'm, and I'm, I certainly, in the alchemist, for example, I'd be silly to think that I, I, I can hear all the layers. I hope I'm open to it, but there's all, you know, there's beauty in that. You know, going back through and being like, oh my God, there's another little universal <laughs> trinket right there that I right. didn't catch at the time. And, <laughs> but the story carries it so beautifully. Yeah. And, and so it's cool to hear you mention those other titles because it, yeah. many people would, would and if you, if you don't, the, the two books and of course the niche right now, you should, you should be seeking it out because if you've read The Alchemist, incredible. The Tower Now, incredible. And, and this is, taking a, a turn which comes into an area that I just absolutely love, which is just the universal laws, the simplistic cliches, if you will, that have been passed down through, but have real simple go with the flow kind of things, you know? And, it, <laughs> excuse me. <laughs> it's this place. I still, have, I still have a little bit of Jason's beat up pants in my <laughs> So, so uh, man, again, we could go for hours here and uh, so let's, let's, there's a couple things I want to hit, but one, where can people take this journey? How do they find the niche? Because it is a journey when he's talking about the little bit that I saw, you know, there's clues and keys that open up things within this. It's, it's a journey, right? And so yeah, where do they find it? Yeah. How do they get the book? How do they take the journey? Where can you lead them? Yeah, you can go to satiristjeering.com, but I'll make it a little easier because the spelling is ridiculous. Um, you can go to theniche.co, so it's T-H-E-N-I-T-C-H, careful with the spelling, I might direct you right. the wrong way, right. theniche.co, C-O, no M. And if you go there, there's, it's, the, it's basically the registration page for the interactive part of the book. Um, but there's a link there that can take you back to the site and you can order the book there. The book that's available on my site is, there's, there's only a few left. And they're the, the um, first edition, which is a leather, hand-bound leather edition. Um, you have to go check style. these out, people. It's, it's a piece of art. And 
There's all I, I, was, I, I really yeah. was going to ask, like, how many of these things exist? Because it's a it's a real process to make these bad boys. So yeah, yeah. There's <laughs> only a few left. You can get them at your site and get going. Yeah, there's a few left that you can get. You can get one from my site. Um, there's also a paperback version that's that is a departure from that leather version um, in the way that there is a, a, an open or free journaling um, aspect to it. So there's a bunch of blank pages in the back that correspond with the individual pages uh, via the illustrations. But that's also available now in paperback form and that's that's less expensive. So on my site, the leather bound books are 45. They're also on Amazon. Um, but then you can get that paperback version through Yellow Suit Publishing. And uh, that's just how it sounds, Yellow, yellowsuitpublishing.com, I believe is what it is. Um, and you can get the paperback version there. And the story is the same, of course. It's just, it doesn't have um, some of the components that that first edition has. All the beauty of it. Uh, let's, let's wrap. God, I wish we could do this for hours. I mean, <laughs> There's the, oh, he's like the doors, that, scratch the the, the, the doors yeah. that you've opened are so <laughs> amazing. And I cannot wait to read the book because it again it, it's a genre and, and a way of, of conveying the story that 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 I love uh, and and uh, so that's that's exciting. And I have it, to say I have to say I only reference those great works like the, I in no way compare the niche to those works. It is a stand. It's a, it's its own thing. But it, like I would never claim that it holds a candle. To things like the power of now and this and this whatever I'm not a huge fan of the seeker but um, uh, alchemist and works works of that nature and but, that my friends is the humility part that comes in every week and I'm sure if you ask the author of all of those books they would say I do not in any way compare myself so uh, d don't don't take any of that go read the <laughs> next because I think you can tell it's it's worth the time invested but I did see in Watching a little bit more about that, you and your uh, merry band of, of actors are doing some things with teaching kids this stuff through the medium or the characters of the this whole yeah. education through entertainment thing. Tell me a little bit about that before we go, uh, you know, kill some pigs and scare <laughs> the hell out of everybody else in the world. One hand washes the other. <laughs> uh, I can't, uh, I can't explain it. Uh, but yeah, so the book is just one encapsulation of this huge realm, right? And so there's a theatrical show that is an attempt to read that book, to read the niche to an audience. But what happens is the three masked um, characters that uh, are kind of the MCs of the show, they wind up in a giant pie fight with confetti blasters going off and everything other than reading the book. Like we read some of the book, you see some of it, but then an acrobat comes in and performs on hoops, and then a musician comes in and plays a few songs, and it's uh, it's just a lot of fun. Been super blessed to you know take it as far as we have. We toured opera houses in Iowa throughout the first part of this year, oh, while trying to build this insanity. It was a nut show. It was just the complete year was crazy. Year of the firecock. That's what this was. And it was like truly that. I mean, yeah. Insane. So, um, but yeah, yeah, yeah. We have a whole show and we work with kids. We do programming with kids. We'll come into a school. We'll break it down. We'll help them explore and understand their own creative process through the story. And there's a whole bunch of layers to that. That's once again, a whole nother conversation because we don't abide by the rules and the structures of what the educational system mandates. We come in and we're a distraction from what they're used to because we want them to engage and, and become alive in, within their own spirit um, in those environments so that they want to be there so that they don't take the, I mean, honestly, so they don't have to take the route that I took. Yeah. You know, it's, it's leaving stepping stones so that they can jump those hurdles. Yes, and know that they can take place. Be the coolest parent in town and get these guys to your young person's school to foster that creativity to, you know, full disclosure and math, all of these things are great, but there is a whole creative side to, to these kids and not every one of them is designed to be uh, a mathematician or an accountant. Some of them are designed to build slaughterhouses and write books and there's a creative 
uh, write music and provide albums to the world and and this is a way to show those young people that there are many paths and providing the most opportunity for them is is in in, in my opinion builds a healthier more colorful more vibrant beautiful planet yeah man and yeah. and so this has, there's no great way to end this this has been an absolute joy dude i i, I know this is the start of a amazing friendship you are in the line of treasures that we have presented to Des Moines, you are at the top of the heap, man. This is this has been a joy. Thanks, dude. Thanks. Cheers. Right on. Cheers. <laughs> right on. We'll see y'all next week on a chapter and a chat, and we gotta go scare the hell out of some people. I'd consider not answering your door ever.